In this video, I'm going to beat Pokemon Emerald with only a clay doll. These are the rules, you can also find them in the description, and here is my methodology. With that out of the way, now let's get right into this, because coming up very soon we have to face youngster Calvin. If you don't already know, he is the first random trainer in the game, and his Pokemon is Poochyena, which really likes to wall psychic types. And Claydol, of course, is a ground psychic type. I knew throughout the month of March that I was going to be doing a bunch of ancient Pokemon in Emerald, so as soon as I decided on Claydol, I checked its move pool to see how it would be able to manage Calvin. I am very lucky that it starts with Rapid Spin. I never thought I'd be saying that because this move is kind of trash when doing a playthrough of the game. But since it deals normal type damage, today it is Claydol's answer for early game dark types. I don't normally talk about the move pool first, but since we're already there, there, let's continue. Claydol also starts with Confusion for direct damage, Harden to improve its defenses, but this isn't really going to be useful today. It also gets Teleport, which is nice because then it can navigate the overworld just a little bit more efficiently. Through Level Up, it gets access to Mud Slap at level 7, Psy Beam at only level 11, Rock Tomb at level 15, Self Destruct at level 19, but of course it's a solo challenge and my rules do not allow this move. By the way, there is a decent number of people that comment saying I should allow this move for the final knockout of every battle, but I'm not going to make an exception just for this move. Beyond that, it gets Ancient Power at level 25, Sandstorm at level 31, Hyper Beam at level 36, Cosmic Power at level 42, this is definitely going to see play today, and finally, once again, Explosion at level 55, but it's not going to be useful. Through TM and HM, Claydol gets access to quite a bit of type coverage. It gets Ice Beam, Solar Beam, Earthquake Dig, Psychic Shadow Ball, Rock Tomb, and of course the standard normal moves, Return and Secret Power. Now of course in my challenges I allow myself to manipulate my starting Pokemon so that I can get the best possible results with each species. In this challenge I decided to go with a rash nature just because I want to boost Claydol's special attack since most of its coverage moves as well as psychic type moves will be utilizing this stat. Either way, this isn't going to make a huge difference because it is a balanced attacker. For base stats, it has 60 HP, 70 attack and special attack, 105 defense, 120 special defense, and 75 speed. It's not the fastest Pokemon, but this speed stat is definitely workable in a solo challenge. After I get Watson's badge, I get a 10% boost to my speed, and then Claydol is probably just going to move first against all of its targets. It has a medium fast growth rate, which is just kind of standard middle of the road fare. Nothing good to report here, but nothing bad. For an ability, it has levitate, meaning it cannot be hit by other ground type moves. I have two things to mention in relation to this ability. The first one is type effectiveness, and the second one is how these abilities are implemented within the game. So for type effectiveness, Claydol has so many weaknesses. It is weak to bug, ghost, water, grass, ice, and dark type moves. That said, because of its ability, it is immune to both ground and electric attacks, and it resists fighting, poison, rock, and psychic. The fact that they gave it levitate really improves this typing defensively, because without it, it has a lot of weaknesses. Luckily, it doesn't take four times damage from anything though. Also in Generation 3, there are no prominent bug type trainers, and the grass Pokemon that exist within the game are just not really that good. That does leave four types that have prominent trainers which could be problematic for Claydol. I expect to have some problems with Phoebe, Juan, Glacia, and Sydney. Okay, the second thing I wanted to talk about in regards to abilities are how they're implemented within the Pokemon's data structure. All Pokemon in Generation 3 are stored in a 100 byte structure. Within this there is a 48 byte block that is encrypted data and this is where the ability is stored. It is a bit flag that's stored alongside the Pokemon's IVs as well as its status as an egg. If you're not familiar with programming, all of this is probably going to make very little sense to you. Essentially, the ability is just stored as a single bit, either it is 0 or it is 1. 
false or true. If the bit is false or set to zero, then the Pokemon's ability will be ability number one. If the bit is set to one or true, then the Pokemon's ability will be ability number two. This is why in generation three and four, Pokemon can only have two abilities. If you're wondering how they stored hidden abilities, well, those were introduced starting in generation five, and by that time they had refactored this structure so that more than two abilities can be stored. The reason I'm mentioning all of this is because I accidentally set my Claydol to have ability number two, which by the way does not exist, Claydol only has a single ability. I thought the game would just default to giving it levitate anyways, but by the time I had played a significant portion of the game, I realized that Claydol in fact had no ability at all. So that's an interesting thing that I found out during this run. Your Pokemon can actually have no ability if it only has one possible ability, and then you set its ability bit to true. Of course, I had to restart the playthrough, and we have been watching the new footage from the start. Okay, so now let's talk about the early game, because of course first we have to face Calvin. This one of course is easy because I have access to Rapid Spin. It's really nice not having to use Struggle here with a Psychic type. Now in the early game, I'm going to fight almost everyone to level up as much as is possible. Before reaching Petalburg City, I get to level 7 and learn Mud Slap in the place of Harden. Just a little while ago, I would have kept this defense boosting move on my set for way longer than I should have. Generation 1 has trained me to treat stat boosting moves with the utmost respect, deleting one and then not being able to get it back can be the kiss of death. But in this case I get access to cosmic power later on, and I don't think Claydol is going to need any help against Roxanne or Brawly. After all, while training in Rustboro Gym, I reach level 11 where I learn Psybeam and put it in the place of confusion. And with that, it is time to face Roxanne. Her Geodudes are very annoying because she uses healing items on them, delaying my knockouts. I would be able to two-hit these if she wasn't so insistent on keeping them alive. With them finished off, she sends in her ace nose pass, and while it does have high special defense, it doesn't really matter. After all, I resist rock type attacks, and tackle is its only other move. So as predicted, this is a straightforward win for me. With the stone badge, I now get a 10% boost to my attack stat, and that's a little bit unfortunate since Claydol is going to be relying on mostly special moves throughout the early game. Well, I do get access to Rock Tomb as soon as I face the optional rival. I put this move in the place of Rack. Rapid Spin, but I really hate using it. Until Generation 6, it has a base power of 50, 10 PP, and 80% accuracy. Essentially, the developers just said, we are going to make a weak rock type move that has very little PP and almost no accuracy. We all know the saying, of course, if it isn't 100% accurate, it's definitely going to miss. And if you want to see this move do that a lot, please go and watch my cradley video from last year. Okay, so with the rival finished off, I'm going to head back to Petalburg City. You might be wondering here why I didn't delete teleport and keep rapid spin? Well, the answer is fairly simple. This field move is going to save a little bit of time navigating the overworld in one specific instance, which I'll mention later on. Of course, just outside of Rust Turf Tunnel, I could have caught myself an Abra, but this requires too much luck to be integrated in a standard playthrough, in my personal opinion. On Route 116, I have a 10% chance to encounter an Abra. That means on average, I would have to fight at least a few other Pokemon before one would show up. Plus, then when it finally does show up, I'm only going to get the chance to use one Pokeball, unless my Pokemon currently knows a move that can induce a status condition. I looked up average to see what its catch rate was, and I was surprised that it is 200. By the way, a higher catch rate means that the Pokemon is easier to catch. However, this number alone doesn't really tell us what percentage chance I would have if I threw a Pokeball at it. So I went to this cool catch rate calculator over on Cave of Dragonflies, and this tells me that with a Pokeball on a level Level 7 Abra, I have a 27.97% chance of catching it. What if instead I threw a Great Ball at it, because I will get access to two of these when I save the employee from the Team Aqua member in Petalburg Forest. In this case I have roughly a 41% chance to catch the Abra, which is a lot better. So in order to pick up this field user to use Teleport outside of battle, I need a 10% chance to have the encounter, and then a 0.41% chance to actually catch it. If we multiply these probabilities together to find out what the chance is that both of them occur, then it ends up being roughly a 4.1% chance. 
for me that is just far too unreliable. I would feel fundamentally like I was cheating if I added this into the game as a manipulation for a field user, so that's why I haven't implemented it. That said, I do manip my HM users, specifically Talo for Fly, Meryl for Surf, Strength, Dive, and Waterfall, and Zigzagoon for Cut and Rock Smash. By the way, this thing can also learn Surf, which is really convenient. Next, I head to Duford Town, picking up the Silk Scarf, and then I deliver the letter. After that, I fight optional trainers within the gym to gain more experience, and with all of that out of the way, it is time to face Brawly. Okay, so uh, Claydol is about to make this guy look like he is the hiker from Generation 1. I'm obviously able to one-hit KO the Machop. Then the Metatite that follows can't hit me because Focus Punch will never land. Claydol cannot miss. Finally, he has his ace, Makuhita. Now, as a kid, this thing gave me a lot of problems because I always chose Trico as my starter, but today with Claydol, I can just one-shot his ace and earn myself the second badge very quickly. On Slateport Beach, fittingly, I can pick up the soft sand. Ah, by the way, I've never realized that you get the sand on the beach. Okay, yeah, that just makes sense. In the beach house, I stop for some battles to earn myself the soda pop. These are great healing items, and so I'm including this detour as a part of my standard first attempt rooting now. Inside the museum, I have to face Carvana, which are dark types, but don't worry, I have Rock Tomb to counter them. North of Slateport City, I face a Roma Lady Daisy, and here I want to plant the seed that Leech Seed could potentially be problematic for Claydol. That's all I'll say for now. Rival 2 is the next major battle. He has a Slugma and a Wingull, and obviously these two are not an issue. But Grovile could be. It has two moves which are super effective, Absorb and Pursuit. In Generation 3, damage category is determined by the move's type, so both Grass and Dark type moves deal special damage, which is perfect for Claydol because it has high special defense. Because Pursuit has a higher base power when compared with Absorb, Grovile is going to prioritize it instead. It's not doing much and my Psy Beams are doing half, so with that, I defeat the rival and move on to Mauville City. On the way, Claydol levels up to 25, and I can learn Ancient Power now in the place of Rock Tomb, so good riddance to you, terribly inaccurate move. In Mauville City, I stop by the bike shop, and here I want to mention a very small detail. I used to press A very carefully throughout this entire text, and this would waste a lot of time. I was doing this so that I could select the proper bike. I thought for some reason that if I pressed B, it would exit out of the dialogue and not give me a bike at all, and I didn't want to spam A because then I would choose the mock bike, which is not the one I need to navigate terrain. Turns out you can just spam A until the option Yes comes up, this will automatically select that option and continue the dialogue, then I switch to spamming B until the choice of bike appears. In this case, B does not cause this dialogue to exit, it just doesn't select anything, and and you get to stop for a moment, decide, and then press A on the option you want. Of course, I choose the acrobike, and now all of us can get through this dialogue just a little bit faster. Around the city, I do minimal training, and while I do that, I want to mention the Game Corner TMs, because you might be thinking that Claydol can access Psychic now. Well, it costs a total of 3,500 coins, which is slightly less than Flamethrower, Thunderbolt, and Ice Beam. All of those cost 4,000. Here's the thing though, 3,500 coins is still a lot. This is the equivalent of 70,000 Poké Dollars. Even if I fought every trainer up until this point and sold every item that I had picked up, I would not be able to buy this TM right now. Many of you have mentioned to me that on Route 104, there are two rich trainers, well, Rich Boy Winston and Lady Cindy. Their Zigzagoons are both holding nuggets. So if you can make it to Slateport City, get the TM for Thief in the museum, and then go back and face both of these trainers, there is the potential to earn a lot of money. I should also mention that these trainers both give great prize money. 1400 from each of them, and if you rematch them, the prize money gets even better, plus both of their Pokemon are once again holding nuggets. Even if I was able to somehow thieve 4 nuggets in total, that is only 20,000 Poké Dollars. I would still have to come up with 50,000 more. Also, this approach 
waste a lot of time backtracking from Slateport City, and it doesn't even work with Claydol because I can't learn Thief. The only other way for me to obtain the coins would be to obtain them through gameplay, and uh, I don't think that that is a time-conscious approach to this playthrough. So instead, I'm gonna head into the gym and face Watson. The first thing I need to mention during this battle is that ground Pokémon can be paralyzed by the ability Static. Luckily for me, Ancient Power does not make contact with its target, so it's safe to use. Plus, I also get the chance for the Omni Boost, which would be fantastic, but unfortunately for me, I don't get one, and then Magneton comes out. Here, Mudslap is doing 4 times damage, and it looks like it's going to be a 2 hit. Plus, the accuracy drop causes the Electric type to miss Supersonic, and then I knock it out. All that's left is Watson's Ace, Manectric. It is forced to use either Quick Attack or Howl, and it does this in the worst possible possible way, it attacks me twice, then it sets up, so yeah Watson, this was really not optimal choices. As a consequence of his terrible play, I defeat him, earning myself the third badge and a 10% boost to my speed stat. In most playthroughs, the next thing I do is I teach my Pokémon secret power, but today I'm not going to. I don't think Claydol needs it, and teleport is about to be useful. I stop by the Pokémon Center in Fall Arbor Town, this way I set my waypoint here. Then I go to the Mart to buy Super Repels, by the way this is my new standard location to pick them up. Now, while I didn't teach Secret Power, I am going to teach the move Dig because it's available now. Of course, I don't need Mudslap anymore. Holding onto the accuracy dropping move is not really a good idea in Generation 3. Sometimes in Generation 2, it does make sense to hold onto it though because there's a decent number of Magnemites throughout the run. On my way to Meteor Falls, I make sure to stop by and pick up the Person Berries. By the way, these are like the best item in the entire game. I cannot believe how many fights I end up using them in. It's very convenient that this early on, you can pick up a total of six. Once I arrive at Meteor Falls and complete the brief cutscene, then I can use Teleport to head back to Fall Arbor Town, skipping a decent amount of backtracking. This is the reason that I was keeping Teleport on my set, and yes, it is only a small advantage, but I do think it was worth it. Alright, so let's take the gondola ride up to the top of Mount Chimney, and now it's time to face Maxi. Mighty Anna is a fantastic lead, because it starts off with Intimidate lowering my attack stat. I was hoping that Ancient Power would let me cancel this out with its secondary effect, but unfortunately then Sand Attack ruins my accuracy. While trying to use Dig instead, I accidentally select Psybeam, which of course does nothing to the dark type. As a result of that and a bunch of misses, I get my first reset here. Before I try again, I can improve Claydol's move set. I teach Secret Power in the place of Teleport because like I said, this move has served its usefulness. Also, I can use the Silk Scarf to boost its effective power from 70 up to 77. Just so everyone's aware, this is one of the few fights in the game where I'm not on regular terrain. In this case, Secret Power can cause confusion. I do in this case, but Claydol crits on the next turn so it didn't matter anyways. My Psychic type has half health remaining for the last two Pokémon. Zubats first, of course I go for Ancient Power, and easily one shot. Alright, so there's only one left, it is Camerupt, and here I need to talk about a really hilarious interaction. So, the Fire Ground type has the move Magnitude, which inflicts double damage if the opposing Pokémon is currently underground. The question then is, what happens if that Pokémon also has has the ability Levitate. Well, if the Camerupt had used Magnitude against me, my ability would have prevented all of the damage. This has to be one of my favorite interactions in the game, it is so silly. With Maxi Clear to pick up the Meteorite, but don't worry, I am not going to use Return once in this video. It's always a breath of fresh air when the Pokémon has better options available to it than the standard normal fare. I descend the volcano into Lava Ridge Town, and now it is time to take on Flannery. As this fight gets going, I just want to say that Claydol stacks up really well against the first four gym leaders. It has super effective same type attack bonus damage against all of them. That's probably why the developers put this thing in Sky Pillar so that by the time you obtain it, there is too much water and you're not going to use it anyways. I have to pick up a rare candy in the desert, and I will just mention that Ball Toy is available here, but once again, it's just after Flannery. This thing would be so useful if you could obtain it in Granite Cave. It's a 
design decision like this that really impacts how much nostalgia surrounds a particular Pokemon. I'm sure many of us would have grown a close attachment to this freaky doll if we had been able to obtain it and make use of it in the early portions of the game. However, with it relegated later into the game, I'm sure many of us just never used it. That said, I am curious to hear the nostalgia that you do have for this thing, so if you have any stories, please leave them in the comments. Backtracking through the middle of the map, I grab the HM for strength, and then in Rustboro City, I deposit all of my HM users. I'm doing this so I can skip the double battle on the bridge just before Petalburg Forest. It wouldn't be an issue at this level, but it just wastes time and I don't gain any relevant experience from it. At the flower shop, I pick up the White Herb, which is going to be very useful against Sydney during the league. Once arriving at Petalburg City, I withdraw my HM users, and then I go to the gym to face Norman. I had to decide between using the soft sand or the person berry for this battle. In most cases, I think the berry is the better option, but here I figured the soft sand would be better because I'm going to be making extensive use of dig. Whenever there's a choice between an item like this, I tend to choose the one that's going to have the longer effect or impact the battle the most. The person berry would be better if I could set up, but I don't have a reliable option for that. Unfortunately, without the berry, Claydol does get confused, but it snaps out the turn it KOs Spinda. I use Ancient Power against the Vigoroth just in case I can get a boost, and in this case I do, which is perfect. Slacking is next, but don't worry, Dig perfectly counters it. I'm going to go underground every turn that it's attacking, so it can never hit me with counter, and then Claydol's going to deal damage on the turn that it's a loaf. This is generally the best strategy against Norman, and it works out very well for Claydol. After that, the only Pokemon left is Linoon, but of course I can easily clean it up. With the Balance Badge, I now have a 10% boost to my defense stat. That means there is only one outstanding badge boost left to obtain, the one from Tate and Liza, which increases both of Claydol's special stats. Having defeated Norman, I now have access to Surf, and I'm going to use this right away to obtain the rare candy in Petalburg City. I backtrack through the middle of the map to Slateport City. Here, I had a little bit of an indecisive moment where I wanted to buy a Hidden Power TM, but I decided against it, instead surfing south of the city to the abandoned ship. Here, I can grab the storage key and then unlock this room to obtain the TM for Ice Beam. I teach it right away in the place of secret power because this move gives me the ability to counter Winona's team. The battles that follow are not notable. I defeat the Aqua members in the Weather Institute and then Brendan before Fort Tree City. Of course, now with Ice Beam, I have a counter to his Grovile. Let's talk about Hidden Power. For this playthrough, I made it a grass type move, so let's go through the IVs that that gives Claydol. Just so you know, unlike Generation 2, my IVs will never be dramatically impacted by a hidden power type choice. This greatly improves strategical diversity, and it doesn't mean that one specific hidden power typing is going to be favored over all others. That is the case in Pokemon Crystal, where hidden power ice is definitively the best one to choose. There are some cases for hidden power ground, rock, flying, and even electric, but by default, hidden power ice is the one that I go to. In this case with Hidden Power Grass, all of my IVs are perfect with the exception of HP and Special Attack, but they're set to 30 instead of 31. This is a reduction of my IVs by roughly 3.125%. In Generation 2, your HP DV can be affected by more than 50%, and your Attack and Defense DVs can be affected by up to 20%. It should go without saying that I far prefer the Hidden Power mechanics here in Generation 3. Outside the city, I grab a rare candy behind this cut tree, and then I deposit my HM users because I don't want to have to do double battles inside the gym. For example, these two trainers will fight you at the same time if you have two or more Pokemon in your party. But if you only have one, then they will just fight you in sequence. By the way, I'm sure many of you already know this, but these two are actually optional trainers. When playing this run, I was thinking that they were required, but thankfully for me, Dolphin Racer left this comment on my Roselia video, so going forward, I will be skipping them if I think it's wise. The the remaining trainers in the gym are all mandatory, and after I clean them up and finish the puzzles, it's now time to face the flying specialist. Okay everyone, this is a great start, check this out. Turn 1 I use Ancient Power, and it gets the knockout, plus it gives me an Omni Boost. 
from here I would be so surprised if Claydol lost, this was the best possible opening. When I mentioned the type effectiveness chart at the beginning of the video, I did say there aren't very many prominent grass types. Well, Winona does have one, it's Tropius, but yeah, yeah, it's Tropius. This thing is really not that good. I often just completely forget that this thing exists on her team when I'm considering all the grass types I'll have to face. Next, of course, is Pelipper, and it can use Protect, which is annoying, but it can also choose Supersonic, and it will do this every turn that you think it is going to Protect. Honestly, I'm just really glad I got a crit against this thing, so it went down in only one hit. Next is Skarmory, and Ice Beam is not enough to knock it out, so I take his Sand Attack having my accuracy dropped. But she only has one Pokemon left, so I'm not too worried. On my first turn against the Altaria, Claydol misses, allowing the Dragon to dance. But due to the Omni Boost, Claydol is still faster, this time Ice Beam connects, and of course it does four times damage, so her Ace faints. The next section of the game, I get to pick up three rare candies. The first I find by this pond in the most scenic route of the entire game. I've also never mentioned that just north of this area is where you catch Reggie Steel, which is not relevant for this playthrough, but I guess that is another ancient Pokemon. The second rare candy I pick up is in this forest, just south of Mount Pyre, and then the final one is atop the mountain, just after clearing out the Aqua members. As I descend, I do want to mention the fact that I'm not going to pick up Shadow Ball right now, because it takes a lot of time to obtain. At this point in my process of learning Pokemon Emerald, I'm starting to think that it makes more sense to give a Pokemon that really needs this move, Hidden Power Dark or Ghost instead. That way you have a counter for Tate and Liza as well as Phoebe without having to go so far off the beaten path. Upon arriving in Lily Cove City, we get to see a rare battle against Brendan. Up until this point I have skipped this optional fight because I didn't see the advantage in doing it. However, there are benefits from winning here and clearing him out. Number one, I get access to the department store and today I am going to buy some vitamins. Three Carbos to improve Claydol's speed and three Calcium to improve its special attack. Also, the Substitute Move Tutor can be found here, and I am definitely undervaluing this move in my Emerald runs. The Magma Hideout's next, and the Maxi fight here is kind of weird. Intimidate and Scary Face ruin my stats, but I make up for this by buffing my defenses with my newly learned Cosmic Power. I do want to take a moment to just emphasize how fantastic this move is for Claydol. It was already a good tank, and this move makes it essentially impervious to anything. Anything but a critical hit, that is. Okay, let's observe the AI doing something smart in a Pokemon game, which is quite rare. When I use Dig to hit the Mighty Yenna, Maxi just switches into Crobat, so it takes no damage. Alright, Maxi, well played. Before I knock the Crobat out, I get confused with Confuse Ray, but this isn't the worst way I can get confused in this fight. You might have noticed earlier on that the Mighty Yenna hit me with Swagger, and it is going to do this again, so I should go through how confusion mechanics work. Whenever a Pokemon deals damage to itself, this damage is calculated using its attack stat and its defense stat. Interestingly enough, there is no correlating mechanic with confusion that uses your special attack against your special defense. I guess the Pokemon are allowed to like kick themselves, but not use fire against themselves. I don't know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Anyways, this is how it's calculated, so if I have been using cosmic power to boost my defense, then I will take less damage in confusion. This means as a primarily defensive Pokemon, Pokemon, Claydol wouldn't deal much damage to itself in Confusion anyways. Consequently, when playing with defensive Pokemon, you don't have to worry about Confusion as much as you do when playing with Glass Cannons. Especially those that love to boost their attack stat exclusively. I'm thinking about Swords Dance users like Crawdont or Absol. With Maxi defeated, I head to the Aqua Hideout and crush Matt. South of Moss Deep City on this island, I pick up another rare candy, and then I pass through Pacific Log Town to obtain a second one on the section of the map with the rapids. For the third time in the run, I deposit my HM users, keeping one in my party with me, because I need to start the fight against Tate and Liza. They will not fight you unless you have a second Pokemon in your party. Of course, it would be possible to mod this requirement out. So I'm going to solicit a little bit of feedback and insight from all of you. Please let me know in the comments if you think this would be in the spirit of the challenge or against the spirit of the challenge. I'm going to tell you how I feel about it right now, so if you are planning to reply, please just pause the video before you hear my thoughts. After all, I don't want my thinking to influence yours. Okay, I assume everyone has either paused or not followed my advice, so here are my thoughts around 
modding out this requirement. My goal is to not change any in-battle mechanics, and while this is technically an out-of-battle mechanic because they need to initiate the battle with me, it changes fundamentally how the battle would operate. As things stand right now, I think that my current implementation of just taking a weak HM user into the battle and having it faint on the first turn is the best approach. This of course does give my solo Pokémon a slightly easier time against their two Pokémon, and we are going to see that scenario play out here with Claydol. So let's not waste any more time and jump right into the battle. On turn 1, since they have to deal with my HM user, I'm just going to set up Cosmic Power to boost my defenses. Zatu is faster than their Claydol, which means it moves first and knocks out my ally. As a result, their Claydol is going to do nothing because turn 1 it loves to use Earthquake, but I have Levitate. In Generation 3, the AI doesn't know what your ability is until it is triggered. Due to this, on subsequent turns, the Claydol is going to be using Psychic. While Claydol won't take much damage from the same type move, it can lower my special defense and that has the potential to get bad. My Ice Beam fails to KO the Zatu, so I know they're going to heal it with a potion. As a result, I use Cosmic Power again, further boosting my defenses. The higher these go, the more impact my Citrus Berry will have when I eventually use it. Additionally, it also gives time for the Zatu to use Calm Mind. Normally this is not a good thing, but today it means Ice Beam does less damage, so they're not going to heal the Zatu again, allowing me to knock it out on the next turn. Next, they send in Soul Rock, and this thing takes so little damage from Ice Beam, which is really frustrating. Instead, I decide to knock their Claydol out so that it stops hitting me with Psychic. While I'm doing this, my Claydol consumes its Citrus Berry, and then upon knockout, they send in Lunatone. Now, this Pokemon is problematic because it knows Hypnosis. Please everyone find Tate and Liza's YouTube channel and tell them that they are doing it all wrong. Anyway, Anyways, in this case, it is not the wrong choice apparently because Claydol just stays asleep and eventually they knock it out. That's another reset for me. Okay, obvious choice to make this fight better, teach Hidden Power Grass in the place of Psybeam. I set up with Cosmic Power four times and I thought that this would be enough. Psychic though is dropping my special defense occasionally like I mentioned before, but the linchpin is the fact that Lunatone's hypnosis once again causes a loss. See, they're trying to convince you that this is actually a good move. Right now my Claydol is so close to leveling up, so I fight one trainer in the gym, and then I use 10 rare candies to boost it up to 58. This massive level increase makes the fight so much easier, but it is still kind of a slog. I polish off the remaining Pokemon, and with that I earn myself the 7th badge and a 10% boost to my special attack and my special defense. Now normally when using a Psychic type, this is where the run gets very easy. The Pokemon's primary offensive stat has just received its boost, and also you get the TM for Calm Mind. Unfortunately for this ground Psychic type, it cannot learn the powerful setup move. Still, Cosmic Power is pretty good. It makes the double battle in the Space Center very straightforward. By the way, I remember as a kid, I thought this move was trash. I was so wrong, it is definitely awesome. After all, I'm sure all of you will know, I love playing defensively. And if you're new to the channel, thanks for stopping by, it's good to have you here. Before the plotline concludes, I pick up the TM for Earthquake. I decided not to teach it right away for two reasons. Ground type moves are not really that good against the Elite Four, and ground type moves are fantastic against Steven. If I teach it now and then delete it during the league, I will not be able to get it back because Claydol does not learn this same type move by level up. Also, this is the only Earthquake TM that you obtain, there is no way to get another one. The battle against Archie is uh, straightforward, yeah, nothing to report here. After that, Kyogre and Groudon have a battle. These two ancient Pokemon are ones that I am so excited to use in Emerald in the future. I expect that Groudon is going to slightly underperform the water type legendary, but both of them have the chance of setting one of the best times yet. Their abilities are fantastic, however there's a little bit of a downside here because they do take extra time per battle because they have to print a lot of text. Well, we'll have to wait for those two ancient Pokemon to get playthroughs. Also, another ancient Pokemon that needs a redo is Rayquaza. Just so you know, here is my current first playthrough tier list, and yeah, this green legendary is not doing so well. So to improve its rankings next week on stream, I will be doing a playthrough using it. That makes me curious about the performance of other legendary Pokemon within the game. But of course, that's not a question for today. With the plot concluded, I have to face Juan. 
Okay, so obvious choice, Personberry here so that I can set up Cosmic Power against the Love Disk and then sweep his team. And Oh, great. It confuses me right away. Well, I did mention that this status isn't the worst thing in the world for defensive Pokemon, so I push for more setup. At plus three, confusion ends, and then I go on the offense. Hidden Power Grass is able to one-hit the Love Disk, the following Whiskash, as well as the Celio. Then Juan sends in his Kingdra. Now I'm not going to be able to two-hit this thing. Also, it knows Rest, and it also is holding a Chesto Berry, meaning it wakes up right away. But Claydol knows what it needs, and in this case, right away it freezes and then crits, so Kingdra goes down. The only Pokemon remaining is Crawdont, and of course, Hidden Power polishes it off with a single hit. The final gym leader has fallen, and of course, inside of Victory Road, I completely crush Wally. There's one more thing that I want to do in this cave, and that's pick up the TM for Psychic. When I did this, I realized that I probably could have bought it from the game corner a little bit earlier than this, but I honestly don't know if I would have used it, because after Winona is defeated, Psychic isn't great coverage against the major battles in your way. Up next for me is Sydney, and of course, Psychic is not going to be useful there. So for now, I will hold off on teaching it. Before starting the league, I got a little bit scared, specifically of Phoebe. Because of this, I decided to backtrack to Mount Pyre to pick up Shadow Ball. Of course, this is a terribly inefficient way to obtain this move, but it is only a first playthrough. I make Claydol hold the White Herb, and with that, I am ready for the Elite Four, so let's do this. Sydney's first Pokemon is Mighty Yenna, but the White Herb cancels out Intimidate's drop. But that's not the only reason it's strong in this fight. It loves to use Sand Attack. Because Dig only does half, Claydol has his accuracy lowered by one stage before I knock out Sydney's lead. For this battle, I usually like to have Shockwave or Aerial Ace so that I can bypass accuracy checks, but unfortunately Claydol doesn't get either of those. In situations like this, things can spiral out of control, especially when the Shift Tree comes out because it loves to use Double Team as well as Torque. Torment. But Claydol does not miss, and as a result, Ice Beam gets the KO. Surprisingly, accuracy is not a problem against the following Cacturn, leading to his Crawdont. Now this thing, as well as his final Absol, love to set up using Swords Dance. While on one hand this is scary, on the other it gives me more opportunities to hit with my moves. And Hidden Power Grass has the damage it needs to finish his Water type off. Against the Absol, I use Ice Beam, it does more than half. As I said before, it chooses to set up with its first turn in battle, and I get the KO for free. Going into the fight against Phoebe, you will notice that I have Shadow Ball in the place of Dig. On the first turn of the battle, I'm going to set up with Cosmic Power because the Dusclops loves Protect. That said, on the second turn, it is much more of a threat because it can choose the move Curse. Without the ability to switch Claydol in and out, I won't be able to cure the status condition, so it's a guaranteed loss if the Dusclops chooses it. Because of this, I have two resets before I finally take down her lead Pokemon. I do want to mention here that it is really lucky that she is not guaranteed to use Curse on the second turn of battle, because then for so many solo Pokemon, they would have to level up and one-shot this thing. Her second Pokemon, Bayonet, gets frozen after she uses a full restore, and I knock it out, moving on to the second bayonet, which Claydol critical hits. Okay, so far so good. It's time for her ace Dusclops. This one does no Shadow Ball, which does about a fourth to Claydol, and it lowers my special defense, but because of cosmic power, this isn't really that much of an issue. I polish it off and move on to her final Pokemon, Sableye. I have to say, I didn't expect this thing to do very much to me, but it's chipping away slowly, and she uses a full restore, allowing it to get me all the way down to orange health before I knock it out. This battle was a little bit closer than I was expecting, and I'm definitely glad that I picked up Shadow Ball. But I'm not through the woods yet, because the difficulties will continue in the next chamber where Glacia waits for me. For this battle, I teach Psychic in the place of Shadow Ball, because Ghost-type coverage isn't particularly useful from here on out. Persilio loves to set up Hail on the first turn, so I can set up with Cosmic Power with Impunity. Also, I do have a Cherry Berry, so until it parallels paralyzes me with Body Slam, I figured that I could just continue my setup. But instead of choosing the normal type move, it selects Ice Ball, which has the same effect as Rollout, but it's just dealing Ice type damage, which is really scary for Claydol. So I decide to knock out her lead over the next two turns. Then she sends in her first Glalie. I do more than half with Psychic. I'm always surprised this thing isn't a Dark type. It really looks like it should be. It goes for Icy Wind, lowering my speed. The next Celio comes out, and I crit it with Hidden Power Grass, which is fantastic. But the chip damage from Hail has really stacked up, 
And then the following Glalie sets it up again, so I continue taking a small amount of damage per turn. Also, uh, this thing knows explosion, and it goes for it, dealing massive damage, plus it gets a critical hit, so of course Claydol can't survive. My strategy for the second fight was to set up more, hopefully taking less damage throughout the entire fight, and I also switched to a Citrus Berry to gain back more health, since I know Hercelio is not using Body Slam. Turns out this strategy is not effective, I have two more resets trying to use it. Okay, so I decided to give up Hidden Power Grass at this point and teach Rest in its place. I figured that the healing move in combination with Cosmic Power would give me the time I need to stall out all of her Pokémon. I can knock out the Celio quickly, preventing it from using Ice Ball, and then set up against her first Glalie. After maxing out, I heal using Rest, and while sleeping, I realized that my Clay Doll does not have very much PP. Okay, it might be slow, but I can KO the Glalie using Ice Beam. But then then it freezes Clay Doll and it doesn't defrost in time, so that's another reset. On the next fight, I make it all the way to the Wall Rain, but then run out of Psychic PP, so the only attack I have left is Ice Beam, and obviously this is not going to work. In the end, the solution was fairly simple. I needed to use a PP up on Psychic so that I can just attack a few more times. Drake is next, and I only have one word to describe how difficult the fight is against him. You might think that I'm going to choose Trivial, but that is not in fact the word I had in mind. The word that was in my mind is Bruno. Okay, so now let's prepare for Wallace. Of course, Claydol has a type disadvantage against his water types. I'm hoping that Cosmic Power can carry me. I wanted to keep Ice Beam on my set because it is useful against Steven, and Psychic is my same type attack bonus move, so let's see if Wallace is possible with these moves. His first team member is Wailord, and I'm actually doing it next week in Pokemon Emerald, and I'm really excited about that run. On turn 1, I use Psychic to prevent damage from Water Spout, because this move is really great. Luckily, after damaging the Water type, it only does about one third to Claydol. On turn 2, I set up Cosmic Power, so I take even less damage. Now, as long as the Whale Lord does not get a critical hit, I can continue my setup. At plus 3, I heal with Rest, and Water Spout and Blizzard only have 5 PP each, so the longer I take in this fight, the better odds Claydol is going to have. I wake up, finish my setup with Cosmic Power going all the way to plus 6, and then I heal one more time before knocking the Whale Lord out. Okay, I'm feeling quite confident with this. I didn't think setting up was going to be so easy. Tentacruel is next. Now, I am super effective against it, but this thing has huge special defense. That allows it to survive one use of Psychic. It hits with Hydro Pump doing about a quarter, and then I knock it out. Whiskash is next. Now, normally this thing tries for Amnesia, but today it's spamming Surf until I heal with Rest. History appears to be repeating itself, because once again my Clay Doll's PP is getting low. I knock the Whiskash out using Ice Beam to conserve Psychic for Wallace's other Pokémon. A Freeze helps me out, and then I move on to his Milotic. This is another Pokémon that has a fantastic special defense stat. Psychic is doing about a third, which is really bad because it knows Recover. But don't worry, Claydol knows what the threat is, and as a result it crits knocking the Milotic out! Okay, this is perfect! Next up is Ludicolo, I choose Rest, and immediately realize that this was the worst possible choice I could have made. Turn 1, it sets up Double Team. Turn 2, it sets up Leech Seed. Turn 3, it sets up Double team again. My health is now being drained every turn, Ludicolo is gaining health every turn, and I can no longer stall because my PP is so low. Plus, Double Team prevents me from attacking. Okay, this Pokemon is awful to fight, I hate this thing. Not as much as the Champion's Sand Slash from Generation 1, but maybe in the future after I do a lot more Emerald runs, especially first stage Pokemon, maybe then Ludicolo will become just as bad. Anyways, in this fight I have a loss, so I need a different strategy. Because of his fantastic special defenders, the Tentacruel, the Whiskash with Amnesia, and the Milotic, I'm going to teach Earthquake in the place of Psychic, and give Claydol the Soft Sand. I get lucky right away because the Wailord misses a Blizzard, but then the luck balances out, because of course, the Wailord freezes with Blizzard, giving me another reset. Okay, this is an audio insert, because when I was recording the voiceover, I missed a reset, just because it was so similar to the 
last one. Once again being caused by a freeze. I'm able to max out my defensive stats in the next fight and then one-shot the Tentacruel using Earthquake. I don't care if the Whiskash sets up with Amnesia, and then when my Lodic comes out, I'm doing half with the Ground-type move. Okay, so this is a much better choice than utilizing Psychic. But up next is uh, Ludicolo, and I'm very worried. Turn 1, I go for Ice Beam, and it only does a third. Okay, let's just pause. Every time I fight this thing, I go to Bulbapedia and I look up its type chart to see which moves do four times damage to it. But of course, no moves do four times damage to this thing. It is an absolute menace. Okay, so let's resume the footage. And yes, I freeze it. <laughs> yep, this is how I win. I can't believe it. So I knock the Ludicolo out and move on to his final Pokemon, Gyarados. It doesn't matter that it has Intimidate because I'm able to use Ice Beam and this has a three hit range. Turn one, Gyarados uses Dragon. Dragon Dance, and then with its only other attack, it uses Hyper Beam but misses. And as a result, Claydol clears Wallace. To this point in the game, it has got a time of 1 hour 49 minutes and 4 seconds, with 15 resets, 0 blackouts, at level 66. This is with a game time of 6 hours and 1 minute. There's only one last trainer, and I need to do a little bit of prep first. I take a trip on the ship to grab the leftovers. This is by far the best item that I could use in combination with cosmic power. Also, I explore one waterfall to grab an additional rare candy, leading me to have a total of two left over, which I use on Claydol to raise it to level 69. Even without these two levels, it still would have been faster than all of Steven's Pokemon, so I'm feeling quite confident about its chances in this final battle. Steven's lead is Skarmory, which is kind of good actually. I can just set up Cosmic Power here with Impunity because this thing can't do anything to Claydol. I guess the only move it really can do damage with is Toxic, but I'm just going to heal with Rest if it chooses that. Unfortunately for me, once I'm fully set up, Ice Beam is not doing very much, and when I bring it down to red health, Steven uses a full restore. Luckily for Claydol, it gets a freeze, but then he switches it out. Okay, I wasn't expecting that. Due to the switch, I do very little damage with Ice Beam against his Aggron, and then Earthquake barely doesn't knock it out. Oh well, it has a terrible moveset, so it doesn't even matter. Cradle is next. Ice Beam is going to be the better choice here. While it does confuse me, it appears that Steven is also suffering from this status condition because he doesn't use a full restore on it, and I knock it out. Things are going pretty well. Next is Armaldo, and Earthquake is doing about a third to it, so I can finish it off, move on to the Metagross, which takes super effective damage from the ground type move, although it just barely survives, and then Steven uses a full restore, and that's when it's sunk in. Once again, my PP is not going to be able to go the distance. Making matters worse, he stalls me longer by using a second full restore, and as a result, Claydol runs out of Earthquake. I now need to knock out the Steel Psychic type using Ice Beam. Surprisingly, I freeze it. There have been so many instances of this status condition. I think it might be the highest rate of frozen Pokemon that I have ever seen in a single run. Okay, so I know I'm not going to knock the Metagross out just spamming Ice Beam. Instead, I want to prepare for the eventual case where I will have to use Struggle. I figured this would be possible because with Cosmic Power, I'm not going to take very much damage. And then with the Leftovers, I will be recovering health every turn, likely enough to fully heal. By the way, I have won this way in previous videos, so I felt that it was possible. I knock the Metagross out using Struggle, and then he sends in his Skarmory again. But don't worry, it's still frozen, so I have some time to just chip away at it using struggle. The recoil damage is inconsequential because I have the leftovers, and even when the Skarmory wakes up, its aerial aces are doing so little. But you know what I'm forgetting about? I'm forgetting about Toxic, because when it poisons Claydol, I have no recourse. As a result, after an incredibly grueling battle that I really did think I could win, the status condition is the thing that prevents me from achieving victory. Okay, I can solve all of these problems by picking up three items. South of Slateport Beach, on this little landmass, you can pick up a PP up. And for a final one, I'm going to go inside Meteor Falls and grab this one that's all the way over on the right-hand side. 
With them, I will be able to use Earthquake six more times, and a total of 16 in the battle. Also, in this case, Steven doesn't switch out his Skarmory, so once I defeat it, I'm in the clear. Because of this, when I make it back to the Metagross, even if it takes a little bit of time, it doesn't matter. The only Pokémon left is his Claydol. I can spam out the remaining uses of my moves, and then complete the battle with Struggle. With that, Claydol clocks in with its final first playthrough time of 2 hours, 4 minutes, and 20 seconds. With 16 resets, 0 blackouts, at level level 70 with a game time of 6 hours and 43 minutes. This real time is faster than Rayquaza's previous result, and slightly slower than Exploud, giving Claydol a B tier finish in my first playthrough tier list. Now, Rayquaza is going to get another playthrough like I mentioned, so I expect that it's going to be ranking up very soon. We should also consider game time. Using this metric, Claydol is faster than Exploud, but slower than Crawdont, giving it an A tier finish. If you're new to my channel, please don't click off, because I have to do my second attempt and see how much I can improve Claydol's results. To start things off, I thought that my rash nature wasn't really helping much. Instead, if I go with a brave nature, I boost my attack, which is actually going to be the more useful offensive stat. Plus, lowering speed instead of a defensive stat is actually going to make this thing more reliable. After all, I'm setting up with cosmic power for a large portion of the run, so it doesn't matter if I'm moving first. Throughout this playthrough, I'm going to be using mostly the same set, although after I defeat Watson, I do not teach secret power because it's just not useful. I intentionally accumulate items and money so that I can now buy Psychic before Norman. This makes the fight against him much more consistent. In the next section of the game, my target level is 50 so that I can use 8 rare candies to go up to 58 before my first attempt against Tate and Liza. Of course, I'm using Rest for them, and by doing this, I take a first attempt victory. So far, Claydol has no resets or blackouts. I really love it when I do faultless playthroughs, so I'm hoping that Claydol can get through the rest of the game without any issues. And I have a plan to make that happen because now I can teach Claydol Earthquake, which is going to be much better throughout the ending portion of the game. Game. In combination with the Soft Sand, it is more useful against Phoebe when compared with Shadow Ball. If you just do a little bit of math, you can easily see this. Earthquake's effective power after the same type attack bonus and the item boost will be 165, whereas Shadow Ball's effective power after the super effective damage it's dealing is only going to be 160. There is some luck involved in this fight, of course, because I did have to dodge Curse, but luckily it happened on my first attempt, so still I have no resets. Before Glacia, I feed Clay all four rare candies to raise its level to 68. Three of her Pokemon are balanced defenders, with her second Glalie being more specially defensive and her Walrein being more physically defensive. That said, Earthquake is still able to do more than half to her final Pokemon, and as a result of Cosmic Power, I shrug off its hits and win. Okay, that brings us back around to Wallace, and of course we know that Earthquake is the right choice here. But you know what all of you don't know? You don't know how awful this Ludicolo is, so let me show Show you. In the first battle against it, I use Ice Beam, hoping for a freeze. By the way, this ice move does so much damage because I get a lucky critical hit. However, I was poisoned by the Milotic, which is not nice, so I have to use Rest, otherwise I will faint. As a result, Ludicolo sets up with double team, and I just miss over and over again. Despite trying to heal with Rest, of course it is hopeless. The happy Sombrero Duck has me, so yeah, I'm just gonna reset and try again. In the next fight, after using Rest, the Whale Lord freezes me. Yes, another freeze. Don't worry, I didn't lose because of this one because Claydol defrosts and I'm able to heal with rest one more time. So I make it back to the Ludicolo and we get to look at this thing smiling at us as it completely destroys me. This time, by setting up Leech Seed, going down to red health, then setting up double team, Wallace uses a full restore healing it, and while I do freeze it with an ice beam, it defrosts right away and sets up more double teams. Okay, so like, I know that I'm doing this voiceover in post after the footage has already been filmed, but I was about to lose my mind when I was doing this original playthrough, and I am trying to capture that energy. Okay, obviously I lose this one, so let's go into the next fight, and once again the Wailord freezes me with Blizzard. I was quite worried about this because I'm at low health, but don't worry, I defrost right away using rest healing to full, so I make it back to the Ludicolo. Oh wait, you thought it was going to go that well? No, 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 it doesn't because my Lodic comes out first, crits with Surf, and knocks Claydol out. 
And I shouldn't have thought that because then the Whale Lord crits me while I'm trying to set up. Okay, so the entire playthrough was very easy up until now, and now Claydol is completely falling apart. Let's talk about what I need to have happen against the Ludicolo, because obviously it is the major threat for Claydol. Well, either I need to crit it with Ice Beam, get a freeze, or just be able to attack three times in a row, which I don't think is too much to ask. Here, I am not expecting anywhere near the amount of luck that I was expecting against Bugsy with Abra in Pokemon Crystal. By the way, that was last week's video, so if you haven't seen it, go and check it out. It's definitely a good one. Despite my poison status, I just try to attack the Ludicolo. While the grass type does faint, then the poison damage polishes Claydol off. This is what happens when you don't use rest, by the way. Luckily for me, I only have five resets here. In this attempt, things go as planned, and I three-shot the Ludicolo. After that, I can clean up the Gyarados and claw in with my Wallace split. In this case, it is 1 hour, 41 minutes, and 25 seconds. Despite the 5 resets, this is still 7 minutes and 39 seconds faster than my previous attempt. Okay, so it's time for Steven, and of course this time I took care of my PP. I have 16 uses of both Earthquake and Ice Beam. Because of that, I do not need to use Struggle, and I defeat him, clocking in with a final Claydol time of 1 hour, 46 minutes, and 52 seconds. With 5 resets, 0 blackouts at level 73, with a game time of 6 hours and 21 minutes. This real time is 17 minutes and 28 seconds faster than my first playthrough. I had 11 less resets, I finished the game 3 levels higher, and I also had 22 minutes reduced from my game time, which is really good. I am very happy with these vastly improved results. Let's bring up the second attempt tier list. It's still very new, so there are only currently three Pokemon in it. I streamed Mewtwo and Hariyama's follow-up playthroughs, and they both performed extremely well. Roselia, on the other hand, was just not nearly as good. Unfortunately for Claydol, it is only 52 seconds faster than the grass type. Granted, it finished the game with four less resets and five levels lower. Plus, its game time was 20 minutes faster. I think both of these two can get better times with luck for Claydol, it is mostly just against the Ludicolo in the Wallace fight. That really was the only battle in this entire follow-up playthrough that was a challenge. I contemplated for a while using Hidden Power Bug to solve him, but I didn't think it would be as good as Hidden Power Grass. It just solves way too many problems for Claydol throughout the playthrough. And while Bug is super effective against Tate and Liza, it's physical and I don't really like attacking their Rock-type Pokémon with physical moves if I can prevent it. Anyways, I'm hoping that I'm moving on to a run where Ludicolo is not going to be a problem. What could possibly go wrong when I use Whale Lord in Pokemon Emerald. And following that, I am going to, of course, have to play with Relicanth. Stay tuned for those two videos coming out next weekend. I hope you enjoyed this one. If you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, thank you so much. It means the world to me. And now, if you've made it this far, you are incredible. I'll see you in my next video.